This is Rudy Kamara. In the following 15 minutes, I'll be giving you a brief introduction to the Common European Framework of Reference for Languages. And I'll focus on basically two questions. Why is the CFR so important? Meaning, why is it important both in terms of language politics and language teaching and testing? And secondly, what is the connection to the training and testing of intercultural communication? To answer the first question, why is the CFR so important, go to the next slide. You will probably be aware that the CFR was first published by the Council of Europe in 2001 in English. This did not mean, however, that the CFR was meant primarily for the English language, which is made quite clear by the fact that as of today there are 39 translations of the CFR available, some into languages which are clearly not European, such as Arabic, Chinese, Japanese or Korean. The fact that educational authorities in so many countries in the world have adopted the CFR as the basis of their language education policies underlines the importance the CFR has gained today. How has it happened that a genuinely European document of language pedagogy should gain such a global impact? To answer this question, let's look at the next slide. Perhaps the first answer to this question relates to the Council of Europe itself. For the Council of Europe, as you probably know, is not identical with the European Union. For a start, it is based in Strasbourg, France, not in Brussels, Belgium. Secondly, it includes 47 member states, only 28 of which are members of the European Union. Thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, the Council of Europe has no administrative power whatsoever. And it is this state of powerlessness, perhaps, that accounts more than anything else for the widespread acceptance the CFR has enjoyed since it was first published in 2001. The Council of Europe normally focuses on issues of human rights, democracy, the rule of law, and generally speaking, social cohesion. It is precisely here, the issues of social cohesion, where the aims of the Council of Europe are identical with those of the European Union, as will be shown on the next slide. The European Union is a challenging project of historical dimension, not in the least so because of its cultural heterogeneity. Strengthening social cohesion by means of active language policies has therefore been one central aim of the European Union. And in doing so, there followed principally three guidelines. Firstly, while committed to political and economic integration, the EU actively promotes the freedom of its citizens to speak and write their own language. Secondly, knowing that each year thousands of European companies lose business and miss out on contracts as a result of their lack of language skills, promoting language skills among its citizens is a crucial objective. And thirdly, the European labour market makes it essential to have an internationally accepted and comprehensible way of describing and assessing language skills at work. It is in these fields that the political aims of the European Union and the Council of Europe coincide. Having said that the Council of Europe is an essentially powerless organization, it should be clear that the CFR was not issued from above, as some people have suspected. Instead, it was the result of 30 years of development work involving a great number of experts from all over Europe. Perhaps one name should be mentioned in this context, the name of Professor John Trim from the University of Cambridge. John Trim was not only a highly esteemed linguist himself, but perhaps his greatest achievement lay in bringing people from all corners of the trade together, motivating them and making them work together to fulfill this, this project of truly European importance. What the CFR provides is in fact something like a comprehensive overview of state-of-art linguistics in a non-dogmatic way. This non-dogmatic approach is underlined, among many other things, by the constant reminder by the authors that, quote, users of the framework may wish to consider, unquote. And this is one of the many strengths of the CFR, 
strengths which may also have contributed to its widespread acceptance in Europe and beyond. On the other hand, the non-dogmatic character of the CFR does not mean that it is without a standpoint, as is made clear by the authors in their insistence on language as a means of practical communication, rather than a linguistic system to be, to be described using linguistic terminology. What this implies will become clear when looking at the advantages of standard setting as suggested by the CFR. Perhaps one thing most people are familiar with when it comes to the CFR are the six levels from A1 to C2. The six CFR levels start with descriptors for the competences of an early beginner and go up to those of a proficient foreign language speaker. It is worth mentioning that what has been called native speaker competence is not described in the CFR. Instead, the CFR describes competence levels of foreign language learners. At a high level, a learner's competences may of course come close to what one would expect from a native speaker. But then the concept of native speaker standards as such has proven to, to be so problematic that it is not used in the CFR in this context. Perhaps the most interesting level on the CFR scales is B1, formerly known as threshold level. The B1 descriptors describe basic communicative competences in a great variety of everyday situations. The next slide will demonstrate this. It may be worth reading this passage from the CFR global scale in detail. The last sentence alone includes a variety of functions which may be considered challenging for many foreign language learners. But then a speaker at B1 may know only one way of expressing gratitude, asking for a favor, criticizing, requesting, etc. Enough anyway to master most everyday situations more or less successfully. This is precisely what B1 is about and why level B1 plays an important role in foreign language teaching in general. To get a clearer picture of how the level system works, look at the next slide. This slide demonstrates what I meant when I said that CFR was a comprehensive overview of state-of-the-art linguistics, focusing on practical communication. Language use, seen as social interaction, includes a great variety of aspects and specific skills, some of which are given on this slide. For example, oral production, listening as a member of a live audience, written production, planning or compensation. For each of these scales, or rather almost each of them, descriptors for all six levels are given. These extensive lists of descriptors have proven extraordinarily helpful for curriculum design, course book writing, teaching, assessing and test construction. It may be worth mentioning that of the 54 descriptive scales of this type included in this CFR, only four have accuracy as their focus. That's grammar, vocabulary, pronunciation and ortho orthography. Four out of 54. All other scales refer to genuinely communicative skills thus underlying the communicative approach of the CFR. Which brings us to the second question asked at the beginning. Why is the CFR important in the context of intercultural communication? To answer this, go to the next slide. The number of books and training concepts for intercultural communication available today is quite stunning. Language trainers, however, will be surprised to find that most of these do not pay attention to the role which language plays in intercultural communication. If at all, language is mentioned only to emphasize that language competence and intercultural competence are not the same. Which is true, of course. On the other hand, how can anyone be competent in intercultural encounters without using language? Or to put it another way, does not true intercultural competence include communicative competence? That is, shouldn't we necessarily think in terms of intercultural communicative competence? And then, can we consider language as culture-free? 
Or isn't it rather so that we actually create and recreate culture in our everyday actions and interactions using language? And doesn't this always take place, even if we use a language such as English as a lingua franca? Such shortcomings of most intercultural training concepts have been pointed out by others before. And we certainly owe a lot to people like Mike Byram and many others. What we suggest paying particular attention to is using the descriptors of the Common European Framework of Reference to identify and define the specific skills needed to become an effective communicator in intercultural environments. This is the intention of the next slide. Intercultural competence is a recurring theme in the CFR, something that is made clear right from the very beginning, as this quotation from the very first page shows, and goes as far as outlining an intercultural personality as a primary goal of all foreign language education. The underlying idea is, of course, that language and culture are inextricably connected. It is also made clear that intercultural competence includes more than language competence, but affects both cognitive aspects and personality development. This is a thought that probably all experts in intercultural training can agree with. But far from limiting themselves to general statements of this type, the CFR 54 scales provide a great number of descriptors which are helpful to specify what intercultural communicative competence may mean in practical communication. Go to the next slide to see a few examples. Several of the CFR scales, among them those for sociolinguistic appropriateness, flexibility, conversation or range, etc., contain descriptors which are helpful for defining specific intercultural communicative competences. Note, for example, the descriptors for sociolinguistic appropriateness, as quoted here. According to this scale, a speaker at B2, quote, can sustain relationships with native speakers without unintentionally amusing or irritating them or requiring them to behave other than they would with a native speaker, unquote. Similarly, a speaker at B2, quote, can interact with a degree of fluency and spontaneity that makes regular interaction and sustained relationships with native speakers quite possible without imposing strain on either party." Unquote. Such descriptors quite aptly describe a competence level which enable anyone to communicate securely with people from other cultural backgrounds. Nevertheless, they have been criticized for relating these skills to a concept of native speakers something which could perhaps be misleading when looking at English as a global lingua franca. In this case, native speakers of English would not necessarily be the ones to consult on issues of standard setting. We will have a brief look at this criticism on the next slide. Undoubtedly, English is the number one language of intercultural communication today. When English is used by one or more speakers of different language backgrounds as a mutual lingua franca, the standards of native speakers of English will not necessarily apply. This is a justified criticism and indicates one of the shortcomings of the CFR in its present form. It is important, however, to note that the authors of the CFR were by no means unaware of the role of English in a globalized world. The reason for not addressing English as a lingua franca but rather treating it as the language of only three of the Council of Europe's member states was a question of language politics and policy. After all, it is one of the central aims of the Council of Europe as of the European Union to promote multilingualism in Europe. It was for that, such reasons that topics connected with English as a lingua franca were not addressed by the CFR in 2001. A decision which may be questioned by many today and which, incidentally, is being revised at this very moment. Since 2014, the Council of Europe's Language Policy Division has once again been involving a large number of European experts in a first revision project of the CFR. Acknowledging that some of the skills described in the CFR in its present form tended to be defined in terms of distance from a fictional native speaker, 
New descriptors for mediation, pronunciation, exploiting plurilingual repertoire and others are now being discussed. These will be made available as of 2017 and will be particularly helpful for defining the interculturally effective use of language in general and also of English as a lingua franca. But regardless of all criticisms mentioned, the advantages provided by the CFSR system of descriptive scales by far outweigh its shortcomings even today. We have therefore used CFR descriptors and suggestions made by eminent contributors to the acad academic debate to identify specific skills which constitute intercultural communicative competence. In fact, both the ICE curriculum and the ICE test are largely based on specifications as suggested by the Common European Framework of Reference for Languages. It is for this reason that we have addressed the subject here. Should you wish to learn more about the CFR and how it relates to a concept of intercultural competence, you may find a special chapter on this in the book written by Judith Mader and myself.